All righty, let's, let's get into chapter six. Chapter six is, um, there are a lot of little technical details in chapter six. Overall on exam two, which covers chapters five through eight, it, it will be more technical and I mean, nothing that you guys can't do, but there are more details than there was on exam one. Let me share my screen here. And let's open the chapter six PowerPoints. All right. So accounting for inventory. Let's see what we, we can learn about this. So we've been talking about inventory from a merchandising company standpoint, and we're gonna keep doing that. Merchandising companies, they only have one type of inventory, which is just finished goods. But manufacturers have three categories. And we're not going to learn about manufacturers in this course. But um, if you take cost accounting, accounting 305, you'll learn all about the three categories of inventory for manufacturers. So raw materials, inventory. Uh, these are items to be used in the production of the final product that they're going to sell. Work in process inventory consists of items partially completed. And then the finished goods inventory, this consists of the fully, fully completed items that are ready to, to be sold. And a manufacturer actually has a separate T account for each of these three inventories. So there's a raw materials inventory T account, which keeps track of the, the dollar value of the raw materials inventory. Same thing for the whip and the same thing for finished goods. But as far as you're concerned in this course, you don't have to learn anything else about those types of inventory. Other than that, those are the three types of inventory that a manufacturer has and the, and the definition of them. Can I ask a question really quick? Sure. Um, they have one type of inventory merchandisers, but so does that mean that like the inventory account itself, even though most merchandisers probably have a really diverse uh, number of items that they're selling, it all just falls into one big inventory account? Each inventory item has its own separate T account, and then the aggregate of those separate T accounts gets dumped into the what we call the parent account, or not the parent account, the master inventory account. And all we do in this class is we usually just debit inventory. That's the master account, but technically you would debit the individual items T account, and then that gets transferred to the to the master. We'll get into the um, master versus um, subsidiary accounts later in the course, but for right now, just think there's just this one inventory. Okay, thank you. Good question, though. Um, inventory management. So, a company can adopt either of these two, or or kind of a hybrid, or somewhere in between. Just in case inventory management means the company holds a buffer, an extra amount of inventory in case unexpected problems occur, you know, so maybe a fire destroys part of the inventory or in case demand is higher than expected. Um, this excess inventory though is costly to maintain. They have to insure it usually. They have to find a place to store it. So they often have to lease space to store it in. Uh, also, the, there's dollars tied up in that inventory, right? And as long as that inventory sits on the shelf and isn't sold, you can't release those dollars, right? In the sense of, it's like an investment. And uh, until you sell it, you don't get a return on it. So also there's opportunity cost, you know, in the space where you are storing this inventory that's not being sold, you could be storing something else that could be sold. It's opportunity cost, right? Revenue that you're giving up by, holding on to this excess inventory. That's an opportunity cost of holding that excess inventory. Uh, and then there's just-in-time inventory management. 
And this seeks to eliminate, or at least minimize, the amount of excess inventory you have on, on hand. Um, it's very difficult to obtain full just-in-time inventory. I mean, full just-in-time inventory is essentially the customer orders an item and you instantly make it, or, or if you're a retailer, you instantly give it to them. And they don't have to wait for you to make it or wait for you to you know, have it shipped from your supplier to you and then they ship it to you. You, you literally have exactly what they want when they want it and you don't have any, anything else anymore. You know? That's really hard to, uh, no company has, well, not, I won't say no company, but very few companies achieve full just-in-time inventory. All right, inventory ownership. Um, goods that are in transit from seller to buyer, they can cause uncertainty as to who owns the items. You know, while the good is on the shipping truck, what happens if the shipping truck crashes? Who has to pay for the items? So who, who, well, whoever owns the items, right? Or whoever, who has to bear the cost, you know? Um, whose items were lost, right? If they're on the UPS truck and the UPS truck crashes. So it's important to know who, who owns the item at all points um, in order to accurately determine, you know, because it affects the accounting. If you own the item and it's destroyed, you have to make a journal entry, right? If you don't own the item, you don't. So shipping terms are usually stated either FOB shipping point or FOB destination point. These are shipping terms. FOB stands for free on board. Don't worry about what that means. It doesn't really have any meaning for right now. But you do need to know the difference between FOB shipping point terms versus FOB destination terms. With FOB shipping point, um, so the seller ships the items to the buyer. Well, the buyer owns the items as soon as the shipping carrier picks up the items from the seller. With FOB destination, the seller owns the items until the buyer takes possession of them. So if I asked you, goods that are in transit from seller to buyer, if the terms were FOB shipping point, who owns them? The buyer owns them. Goods that are in transit from seller to buyer, if the terms were FOB destination, who owns the items while they're in transit? The seller owns the items. At the end of a period, and in chapter six, in the main chapter six, we are assuming the company is using a periodic inventory system, not a perpetual inventory system like we were assuming in chapter five at the beginning. So at the end of a period, the company will make a physical count of inventory. And even a company that uses a perpetual inventory system, they might not make a physical count at the end of every period, but certainly at the end of a year, they will do some sort of count to see what, how much inventory they have. They might try to camp, count just a sample of their, their inventory and then extrapolate you know, to, to see if, if what they have, what they think they have, they really have. But a periodic company, a company that uses a periodic inventory system, they will make a physical count of inventory. Um, there are various reasons why the actual inventory that they have on hand may differ from what they have in their accounting records. Obviously, if they use the periodics method, the actual inventory differs from what they have in their accounting records, right? Because you don't make an entry in the accounting records until you make the physical count. So that's definitely a reason. But then other reasons are theft, um, spoilage. So an item is stolen from your inventory that you didn't know about. That you didn't know it was stolen. You assumed it was there, but it was actually stolen. So your accounting records would differ from your count. Spoilage. Your accounting records assume, assume the items are fine, but then you find out through the count that they're spoiled. You actually have to, you know, get that out of your inventory. You have to make a journal entry. And then, of course, errors. 
So here's an example. Assume this company, it says they use a perpetual inventory system, but they do take a physical count at the end of the year. Assume they discover that the inventory account shows $800 more than the physical inventory account. So they have to make a journal entry. They have to write down their inventory by $800. Their inventory account has too much in it. And so to do that, you credit inventory, debit cost of goods sold expense. If you're a periodic company, and you make a physical count and you discover the same thing. You make the same journal entry. So it doesn't really matter whether Savannah is perpetual or periodic. When you make a physical count and you discover that your inventory is off, the dollar value in your inventory account is different than what it should be, you make, you make this journal entry. It's very unlikely that the dollar value is an is an underestimate of what you have you're not going to find new stuff there that you didn't have before so you're you're never going to write your inventory up you're always going to write it down or do nothing and right? nobody's just going to gift you inventory i've heard of theft but not gifts all right the main part of chapter six we're going to talk about for the rest of the lecture and it's different inventory costing um, different ways to arrive at the cost of goods sold expense and the dollar value of ending inventory. There's actually three different ways you can estimate it, both of those two things. You can either use, well actually there's four ways, but companies rarely use one of them. And throughout we're assuming until we get to the appendix that the company is using the periodic method. Appendix 6A, it, it takes you through these four estimate estimations, assuming the company uses a perpetual method. So you're responsible for Appendix 6A, and you're responsible for Appendix 6B. We'll get to that later. In fact, as we go through this running example, I, I may, even though we're doing periodic of these four things, I may show you what to do if you were using perpetual method and you were doing these things, just so you can see the comparison. But that is summarized in Appendix 6A, the perpetual method. So there's two methods that you can use to cost your inventory. It's either periodic or perpetual. And then within those two methods, each of those methods, um, you can esti you estimate COGS and ending inventory or you measure COGS and ending inventory using one of these four estimation procedures, if you want to call it that. And GAP allows the company to choose which of these four they want to use. So in, and it, see the PowerPoints calls these four things, instead of calling them estimation procedures, it calls them methods and so you get, get confused by the word method because we were talking about you know the two methods are periodic versus perpetual and then there's four different estimations within both of those you can either use specific identification fifo lifo or weighted average whether you use periodic inventory costing method or the perpetual inventory costing method you you get to choose one of those four this calls them methods but i'll call them procedures or estimation procedures so don't get confused by the terminology. Hopefully you don't. We're all talking about, all of this is companies using a periodic method. And um, the question is which estimation procedure are they using? So in determining which are, to understand this inventory costing estimations, we need to make an, a distinction between the physical flow of goods and what we are assuming in terms of our accounting cost flows. So the physical flow of goods just represents, you know, how the goods flow. And usually the physical flow is FIFO. 
The first goods that come in to our inventory are the first goods that leave, especially when it comes to perishable items like eggs and things like that, right? You want to sell the things that you've got first. You want to sell those first. Otherwise, they'll go bad if you let them sit on the shelf and sell the things that came in last first, right? So usually the physical flow is a FIFO. But in terms of costs, GAP allows a company to use a cost assumption other than FIFO if they want to. In other words, like say, say we have two items in our beginning inventory. So two at the beginning of the month, we have two things sitting in our storeroom. And then also assume that we purchase two items during the month. And then also assume that we sell two items during the month. So at the end of the month, how many items do we have in our storeroom? Well, we had two at the beginning, then we purchased two, so now we had four. So we had two available for sale. We sold two of them, so that means we got two left at the end in our inventory. Now, which two did we sell? Probably, we assume a physical flow of FIFO. The two we sold were the, the two sitting there at the beginning, not the two that we purchased during the month, because first in, first out. These two that were already there, those came in first, so those are the first to leave. So the two we sold are probably the two from the beginning. That's the physical flow. But what GAP allows is, so the cost of goods sold, right? Most accurately, the cost of goods sold would be, you would just, we know we sold these two, so we go look at the invoices, what we originally paid for those items and add up the cost, and that's the cost of our goods we sold. But GAP allows us to assume something different. Even if we really did sell these two, GAP, assume, GAP allows us if we want to, to, to assume that the two we sold were these two and use these costs, whatever it cost us to buy these two as the cost of the goods that we sold, even if we didn't really sell those two. GAP allows company to do that if they want to. So that would be a LIFO cost flow assumption, but a FIFO physical flow. Physical flow is always FIFO, but we would be using a LIFO cost flow assumption. We're assuming even though even though the two that we sold were the first ones. In terms of calculating the cost of goods sold, we don't take the cost of those first ones as our cost of goods sold. We take the cost of the last ones, the ones we most recently purchased, the last ones that came in. And we, we attach that cost to the goods that we sold, even though it's the wrong cost. We match the wrong cost with the wrong items. The gap allows the company to do that if they so choose. So that's what this chapter is about. So a company can use either specific identification. Specific identification matches exactly the right cost with the right item. So if we really did sell these two, then we find the cost of those two and that's the cost that we match. Um, what if the two that we sold, what if one of them came from here and one of them came from here? The specific identification would grab the cost of this one and attach it to that item and a cost of this one attached to that item to calculate the cost of goods sold. It specifically identifies, it's the most accurate. Specific identification is the most accurate, but companies don't use that method. It's too, that accuracy comes at a cost, no pun intended. To be that accurate, you have to have a very sophisticated system to be able to track that, usually. Not always. So most companies don't use specific identification unless they're selling, you know, high dollar value items and they very rarely sell anything. Then it's easy to track, right? But if they're selling stuff all the time, then they're not going to be using specific identification. So most companies will pick one of these three methods. 
in terms of their cost flow assumption. If they choose FIFO method for their cost flow assumption, well, that, that matches the physical flow. So that's, that, usually that matches the physical flow. And so FIFO tends to be a little more accurate. They can also choose the LIFO assumption. Or they could choose sort of a hybrid of these two. It's called the weighted average cost. So we're going to go through each of these methods. Um, I've already talked about that one. And FIFO is just first in, first out. And we're talking about the cost flow assumption here, not the physical. Physical flow is FIFO, most always, pretty much always. But um, with the FIFO, we are assuming that the units purchased more recently, uh, the, the units that have been purchased more recently are still here, and the units that were purchased you know, oldest are gone. Those are the ones sold. First in, first out. Last in, first out, the units that have been purchased more recently are the first ones that we sell, and the ones that we purchased that are the oldest are the ones that are left in our ending inventory. Now it turns out that we're going to assume in this chapter that prices are rising over time. So when we're purchasing inventory, we're, going, we're having to pay more. For a given item, we have to pay more as time goes by. Costs rise over time. That reflects reality. And given that prices are rising over time, companies often have an incentive to choose LIFO, to value their inventory using LIFO, because LIFO will realize a higher cost of goods sold expense than FIFO when prices rise over time. Why? Go back to this example. These two items we sold, if we assume, what if we assume full LIFO? We would assume that these are the two items we sold, the two items we purchased most recently, right? And these two items cost us more than these two items because prices are rising over time. And so we'd be assigning a higher dollar value to cost of goods sold than if we assume that the two items we sold were actually these two items and we attach these earlier lower costs to those items. And so a lot of times companies choose LIFO whenever they report their tax to the, to the IRS because their expenses look higher, right? their cost of goods sold expense is higher. So their net income is lower and their taxes are based on net income. So they'll have lower taxes. What the LIFO conformity rule says is if a company uses LIFO to report to the tax authorities, then they have to use LIFO for financial reporting as well. It's not like you can have your cake and eat it too. You can't report to the IRS a, a higher cost of goods sold expense and a lower net income number so that you can pay lower taxes and then report to your shareholders using the FIFO method, which would be mean a lower cost of goods sold expense, therefore a higher income, and you look better to your shareholders, you're doing better. If you choose LIFO for tax reporting purposes, you also have to choose LIFO for financial reporting purposes. It's called the LIFO conformity rule. So there's, there is this assumption in here that I, um, maybe I should write it here, prices for inventory, are rising over time. We're assuming this throughout this chapter. And then the weighted average uh, procedure, it just averages the cost of purchases so that units are valued at an average. Each unit is valued at the same cost. Any new purchases you make, that will cause a re-averaging of the per unit cost. So the best way to really illustrate these methods is through an example. So let's do one. Let's do an example where the company is using a FIFO cost flow assumption. 
Kanzu company sells dog collars. And this is their inventory data for June of 2016. And maybe I should do this. So it's bigger. So their balance June 1st in their inventory T account. Well, there's 20 collars in their storeroom. Each one they purchased for $12 whenever they purchased them back in May, I guess. And so the June 1st balance in inventory is 20 times 12, whatever that is. $240, it looks like. Then they made, uh, then they purchased 40 collars on June 8th for $13 each. Notice prices are rising over time. Notice that. And so the dollar value of those purchases, they would have debited inventory. Well, they would have debited purchases, but eventually their inventory account would go up by 40 times 13 or 520. Then they sold 48 collars on June 13th and they sold them for $30 each. That's the price they charged their customer. The question is, these 48 collars, what did they cost us to buy? Well, it depends on what you're assuming, right? It depends on to the 40, are, the, are you grabbing 40 from here and then eight from here? That would be a LIFO assumption, right? Or are you grabbing uh, 20 from here and then 28 from here? So you can see, you see how it could be your assumption of which ones did you sell matters in terms of cost, if costs are rising over time. So hopefully you can see the issue here. All right, let's keep going. And then on June 21st, we purchased 36 collars for $14 each. And then finally, June 26th, we sold 26 collars again for $30 each. So we had two purchases and two sales during this month. Here was our, here was our other purchase. So here's our beginning, here's our first purchase, here's our second purchase. So essentially what we have in this chapter is we have a company, here's its T account for inventory. We're gonna be given the beginning balance, given. We're gonna be given the dollar value of purchases. In this case, here are the purchases given. And what we want to estimate is we're going to estimate cost of goods sold. We'll call that X. And we want to estimate ending inventory. Call that Y. These are the two things that are unknown. And which, what procedure you use to estimate X and Y depends on if you're using FIFO. You can either use FIFO to estimate X and Y, LIFO, or weighted average. That's what we're doing in this chapter. All right, so to, what would FIFO do? First, FIFO would say, what are our total sales? Well, it, 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 either of these three methods. What are, what, how many units did we sell? How many units did we in total purchase? So we sold 48 on June 13, and we sold 26 on June 26. So 48 and 26, the 74 is what we sold. And we're using the periodic method, right? We're assuming that. So we're at the end of the month, we just calculate the total number of units we sold, 74. And now we make our assumption. We're assuming the first ones that came in were the first ones that were sold in terms of the cost that we're going to, going to attach. And so we're going to grab these units that were sold, we're going to assume 20 of them came from here. Then we saw, then the other, then 40 of them were these purchases. And how many does that total up to? That total 60. We have 14 more to account for. And then 14 came from these purchases. Grab 14 from here, 20 from here, 40 from there, and 14 from there. That makes up the 74, right?
These 20 were purchased for $12 each. These 40 were purchased for $13 each. And these 14 were purchased for $14 each. And so 20 times 12 plus 40 times 13 plus 14 times 14. That's the cost of goods sold expense under FIFO. That would be our estimate of the cost of goods sold expense. That would be X. So let's do that. Twenty times twelve plus forty times thirteen plus fourteen times fourteen. Nine hundred and fifty six dollars is our estimate of X. Our beginning balance was two forty. Our purchases totaled up to be whatever 520 and 504 is, uh, 1,024. And so you could imagine, we could guess why, right? Or we could back out why. 240 plus 1,024 minus 956 equals Y, which is our estimate of the ending, the dollar value of our ending inventory. But let's estimate Y separately, not by backing it out. Let's use FIFO to estimate Y. You should get the same number. I mean, you can check yourself. 240 plus 1024 minus 956 should equal y, but we're going to get y independently of doing that calculation. That's sort of cheating in this chapter. But I mean, you're still, you can get y independently and then you can check it. If it doesn't fit into that formula, then you must have calculated y wrong. All right, here's how to get y independently using the FIFO method procedure. So how many units are left in our ending inventory? That's what we have to determine. We had 20 at the beginning, right? We bought 40. We sold 48. We bought 36. We sold 26. So how many are left? In other words, we had 20 at the beginning. Uh, we purchased a total of 76. And we sold a total of 74. So we should have 22 left at the end of the month, 22 units. And now we're assuming FIFO. Those units left at the end, are those our oldest units? Or are those our most recent? units that we purchased. So in FIFO, they're the most recent units we purchased, right? Because the oldest units first in were the first to leave. Those are already gone. So the units left at the end are our most recent units. So those 22 units that are left at the end, they must all be from these 36 that we purchased. So 14 of the 36 we assume we sold, and the other 22 of the 36, those are our, that's our ending inventory. And so the 22 times we bought each of those for $14. That's the dollar value of our ending inventory. That's right here. That's the 308. And now we can plug in, does 240 plus 1024 minus 956, does it equal 308 for Y? And if it does, we did it right. This is the FIFO method. FIFO would assign a cost of goods sold expense of $956 and an ending inventory value of $308. Let's go look at the next method, the next procedure. What if we were using LIFO? Keep in mind, we still have our 74 units sold and our 22 units left at the end. These are the two things you should calculate first when you do these problems. How many units did you sell? How many units were left at the end? These 74 that we sold, if we're assuming LIFO, where did those 74 come from? They came from our most recent ones first, and then we work our way back up. So those 74 units we sold, the first ones we sold were these 36 that we purchased on June 21st. 
And then the next ones we, how many does that leave us? That leaves us, um, how many does that leave us left? 74 minus 36, 28? No, not 28, 38. 38 units, the next 38 units we sold came from our June 8th purchases. So we'll grab 36 from here, 38 from here, and those are the units that we sold. That's what we're assuming. And so the cost of goods sold, these 36 we bought each for $14, and these 38 we bought each for $13. So it'd be the 36 times the 14, plus the 38 times the 13. This is what LIFO would calculate the cost of goods sold as. 36 times 14 plus 38 times 13, 998. Notice the LIFO COGS is bigger than the FIFO COGS. Remember FIFO COGS? On the previous slide, what did we calculate for the cost of goods sold using the FIFO method? We calculated 956. LIFO, we calculate 998. LIFO COGS is always bigger than FIFO COGS when prices are rising, as they are right here, right? 12, 13, and 14. When prices don't rise, LIFO and FIFO COGS are the same. And when prices are falling, LIFO COGS is smaller than FIFO COGS. But we're assuming in this chapter that prices are rising. So I'll say this is bigger than the FIFO COGS of 956 on the previous slide. So in our T account, we have our beginning balance of 240 given to us right here. Then our purchases, which was, they sum up to be 1,024, that's given to us. And then we're just trying to estimate our um, COGS, which we estimated to be 998. And then now we're trying to estimate our ending inventory dollar value using LIFO. Of course, you could do the 240 plus 1,024 minus 998 and get it, but that's cheating. Let's do it directly. How many units are left at the end of the month? There's 22 units. And if we're assuming LIFO, which 22 units are these? Are they the oldest ones that we got? Are those the ones left? Or are they the most recent ones that we got? Well, the most recent ones we just got, we assume we sold those. So the, they're the oldest ones. So 20, these 20 are part of the 22, and then we grab two from here. 38 of these we assume we sold, and two of them are left. So the ending value, the LIFO ending inventory dollar value would be 20 times, we purchased those 20 that were there at the beginning for 12 each in the previous month. And these two that we purchased on June 8th, we purchased each for $13. So the LIFO dollar value ending inventory would be 20 times 12 plus two times 13, $266. And that's what they did here. Notice the LIFO ending inventory is smaller than the FIFO ending inventory. That's always true if prices are rising because the LIFO COGS is greater than the FIFO COGS. That means the LIFO ending inventory is gonna be smaller than the FIFO ending inventory. Remember the FIFO ending inventory was 308. So you're responsible for not only knowing how to do the methods and get the, the dollar value of COGS and ending inventory, but also you're responsible for remembering the relationship between the methods, like which one's bigger, which one's smaller. And then what about the weighted average method? You're definitely going to have to work practice problems on this. Otherwise you're not going to get, you won't get all of this just from this lecture. You're gonna to have to go back, watch the lecture, work through problems. We're gonna work problems obviously on Thursday. At first it might seem like a lot, what does weighted average do? Weighted average is easier than LIFO and FIFO. It's, it's actually pretty easy. 
So we take the same problem and we're still trying to same we're still trying to estimate cogs over here. We'll call that x, and we're still trying to estimate y, it's just we're going to use the weighted average method. We still have our beginning of 240, and we have our purchases of 1024. Those are given to us. Those will always be given to you in this chapter. What's x and what's y? Well, what weighted average does is it first calculates. Well, there's two ways to think about this, they're both equivalent. You can pick which way you want to think about it in terms of calculating, but they're both actually mathematically equivalent. I'll describe it to you the way the book does first, and then I'll describe it to you the way I think about it. The way you do it is you calculate the weighted average cost per unit. And that's just equal to the total cost of goods available for sale. divided by the number of units available for sale. The cost of goods available for sale is just the beginning inventory value plus the purchases. So 240 plus 1024. And then we divide that by the number of units available for sale. How many units did we have available for sale this period? Well, we had 20 at the beginning. We purchased 40, so then we had 60 available to be sold. And we purchased 36. So at, at some point this period, we had 96 units available for sale. We sold 74 of them, and there's 22 left at the end. But we had 96 available for sale, and so this is the weighted average cost per unit that you calculate under the weighted average method. You got to do this step first. And then once we have this weighted average cost per unit, and how, what is it exactly? So it's $13.17. Then to calculate cost of goods sold, you just take the weighted average cost per unit and you multiply it by the number of units that were sold, 74. And you would get approximately this. They rounded to the nearest dollar. And then how do you calculate ending inventory? You just take the weighted average cost per unit and you multiply it by the number of units that are sitting there in ending inventory, which is 22 units. And you would get $290. Notice that the cost of goods sold calculated using the weighted average procedure is right is between the cost of goods sold that you calculated using the LIFO procedure, which is 998, and the cost of goods sold you calculated using the FIFO procedure, 956. 974 is between 956 and 998. That's not a coincidence. When prices are rising, weighted average will always be between the two. Same thing for ending inventory. Weighted average ending inventory was 290. LIFO ending inventory was 266. FIFO ending inventory was 308. So 290 is between those. Ariel asks, how did you get to 22? I did that back here. I mean, we can do it right here as well, but. We had 20 collars, then we buy 40, then we sell 48, then we buy 36, then we sell 26. So how many do we have left at the end of the month? 22. Or another way to say it is we have 20 at the beginning. Um, we purchased during the period 40 and 36 or 76. And then we sold during the period 48 and 26 or 74. And so at the end of the month, we have 22. Does that make sense, Ariel? You're welcome. So this is the weighted average method. Now, I, I told you there's another way to think about it. 
Um, it's a mathematically equivalent, and it comes to whenever you calculate this. With this calculation, you don't really get the notion of weighted average. Weighted average means you're taking the average of two or more things using weights. If you just say average, that means you're implying a weighted average. Like what's the average of, uh, I don't know, let's say 10 and 20. You take 10 plus 20 and you divide by two, right? But isn't that the same? It's just one half times 10 plus one half times 20. This, this is the weighted average of 10 and 20, where we assign a weight of a half to each item. We just call that the average, equally weighted average. You can think of the weighted average cost per unit just like that as well. You can think of it in the same, in the same way. And let's see how we could do that. So in this one, we're still going to get the same number of 13.17. But what we can do, how many units do we have available for sale? 96. Of those units, um, how many were our beginning inventory? 20. So we'll attach a weight of 20 over 96 to the $12 price. How many of those 96 were from our purchases on June 8th? 40 of them. So we'll attach a weight of 40 over 96 to the $13 price. And then how many units of those 96 were from our purchases on June 21st? The rest of them, right? The other 36 of them. So we'll attach a weight of 36 over 96 to our $14 price. And in that sense, we're computing the weighted average of these three prices, $12, $13, and $14. And the weights we're putting are these weights. Twenty, forty, and thirty-six do add up to ninety-six. The weights have to add up to one. So you would also doing this, you would get thirteen dollars and seventeen cents. Mathematically, that's exactly the same as doing this, right? Because we have a common denominator, just twenty times twelve plus forty times thirteen plus thirty-six times fourteen over ninety-six. But um, you lose the notion of weighted average when you do that. And so this brings it back. This is weighted average. We're, we're, what are we calculating the average of? We're calculating the average of this price, this price. We're trying, to, we're trying to figure out, on average, of all the goods that we have available for sale, what did we spend for those goods per unit? Well, for some of the goods, we spent $12. For some of them, we spent $13. And for the other ones, we spent $14. So if we calculate this weighted average, how many of the 96 did we spend $12? 20 of them. So 20 over 96 is the weight we attach to 12 and so forth. And so the weighted average of the 12, 13, and 14 is actually $13.17. It's not the arithmetic average. We're not attaching an equal weight, one third, one third, one third to each of the three prices. We're actually attaching a bigger weight to the $13 price because we purchased more units at that price, which makes sense. So that's another way to think of weighted average, the weighted average cost per unit or the weighted average purchase price, if you want to think about it like that. I like to call this the weighted average purchase price. We purchased inventory. These 96 units we had available for sale this period, we purchased those 96 for three different prices, 12, 13, and 14, and we're calculating a weighted average of those purchase, price, purchase prices. All right. As you can imagine, since the three methods lead to different estimates of COGS and ending inventory, three methods, right, lead to different estimates. Um, we can, this will have an effect on the financial statements, right? Where does the ending inventory show up on the financial statements? Balance sheet, right? And where does cost of goods sold expense show up on the financial statements? Income statement. 
So the method that produces the highest cost of goods sold is going to be the one which has the lowest net income. Okay? And the one that produces the highest cost of goods sold will be the one that has the lowest ending inventory. And that'll go on the balance sheet. So in our example, um, FIFO's COGS was the lowest. Weighted average was the second, second, and then the LIFO COGS was the highest because we attached the most recent prices, which are higher, to those units that were sold. And therefore, as long as our revenues held constant, which we'll assume, same revenue, um, then our, our gross profits will be higher under FIFO, then lower for weighted average, and then the lowest for LIFO. And therefore, when we subtract all of our other expenses, which assuming they're held constant between these three methods, because these three methods are only methods used to do inventory costs, not for the other stuff, then our net income under LIFO will be the smallest. And then the ending inventory, since FIFO produced the highest, I'm sorry, the lowest cost of goods sold, it produces the highest ending inventory because there's a negative relationship between cost of goods sold and ending inventory. You know, cost of goods sold is on the right, right hand side of the inventory T account, and ending inventory has a normal debit balance it's on the left hand side. So there's negative relationship. Then weighted average, and then since LIFO has the highest COGS, it has the lowest ending inventory. So life, if a company uses LIFO for financial reporting, they put that in one of the notes to their financial statements. That's one of the things that would go in the notes. We use LIFO to value our inventory. That just lets the shareholders know that, hey, your net income is going to look kind of smaller because you're going to have a higher cost of goods sold. And you're, on your balance sheet, your current assets might look a little bit low because your, your inventory is lower because you use LIFO. Companies often use LIFO, though, because they want to save on taxes. If you have a lower net income, then you pay less taxes. But according to the LIFO conformity rule, if the company uses LIFO for tax reporting, they also have to use LIFO for financial reporting. If you want to report to your shareholders, your best method to make yourself look as good as possible is to use FIFO. If you want to pay lower taxes, your best method to use is LIFO because it makes your income look worse. A FIFO cost flow assumption approximates the physical flow of the goods most, most clearly. LIFO cost flow assumption is the opposite of the physical flow usually but it's popular for companies. They like to use it because of potential tax savings. Weighted average is somewhere between them. And specific identification, if a company can actually do that, it is the most accurate one. It, it, then, we're, then we're not attaching the wrong costs to, to the units that were sold and the wrong costs to the units that are left. LIFO kind of puts the wrong costs, right? And so does FIFO if we're not exactly doing FIFO in terms of the physical flow. But specific identification would get it exactly right. But most companies don't use that. All right, have you guys been paying attention? Which method yields the highest cost of goods sold whenever prices are rising? Thank you, yes, y'all are right, LIFO, good. You're right. What about if we make an error? Several questions, there's a couple, well, at least one question on the exam too about making errors. We are a periodic company and we make a, well, even a perpetual company sometimes makes an error um, and, and when, they, when they do their count. But so we're a periodic company, that's what we've been assuming. And we make our count. 
and we we make our account of ending inventory and we were off we make an error since the dollar value of ending inventory it it carries to the next period our ending inventory this period is next period's beginning inventory and because of that that's going to affect next period it's also going to affect this period's cost of goods sold so if we um, Beginning, purchases, cogs, and ending. If we underestimate this, then this is overestimated this year. And then next year, since this is underestimated, that becomes next year's beginning balance. It's underestimated here. Suppose next year our purchases, we, those are fine. And suppose next year we, we count our ending inventory correctly, then, but then our cost of goods sold next year is gonna be off, right? Because this number is too small, right? This will be too small because it was too small last year. So this year it's too small again. It's the beginning inventory this year. So the sum of these two things will be smaller than it should be. And, we, and so the cost of goods sold uh, next year will be bigger than it should be. To get the, you know, to get this equation to work out, you're gonna to have to put a bigger number here than what is, is correct. So if you underestimate inventory, if you understate inventory this year, your cost of goods sold this year is overstated. Assuming that you correctly counted your inventory next year, your cost of goods sold next year is uh, also overstated. No. Understated should be the no also overstated yeah so i think they're going to go through through the example here the best way to do it is to actually put dollar dollars on the account and you can you can it's easier to see that way so kate had beginning inventory for 2016 totaling 30,000 i'll just put 30 Take the zeros away. And then they purchased 300,000 of inventory in 2016. So this is 2016. Its inventory count at the end of 2016 was 40,000. That's what they counted. However, that count included 5,000 5, of items they counted twice. So it's actually overstated by. 5,000, it should be 35,000. So I'm gonna put the correct number here. This is correct, 35,000. It's what it should have been, but they counted 40,000. So in 2016, is their COGS understated or overstated? Well, to calculate COGS in 2016, assuming they counted 40,000 here, they would have done 30, and I should take away the zeros because I'm using those zeros here. They would have done 30 plus 300 minus COGS equals the incorrect 40. And they would have found that COGS equals um, 330 minus 40 or 290. Is that wrong? Yes. They should have put instead of 40 here, they should have had 35. That would have been correct. And then they would have calculated correct COGS of 330 minus 35, 295. This is correct COGS. And this is the COGS if they miss, if they mess up on the inventory count at the end of the year. So their cost of goods sold this year, if they overstate inventory, they overstated it by 5,000. Their cost of goods sold is understated by 5,000. They would arrive at 290 instead of the correct 295. They would understate it by 5,000. Let's look at the effect though in 2017. In 2017, carrying forward the 40, The incorrect number from the previous year 
and actually we're going to do that in the next slide. So let's If we carry forward the incorrect number from the previous year, and also this year we purchased 350, it says. And at the end of 2017, we count that we have 50. And that's correct. That's important. If that was incorrect, then we would have multiple errors here. But suppose that's correct. Then Um, by how much is cost of goods sold either under or overstated this year? So what's cost of goods sold? We would, we would solve cost of goods sold would be 40 plus 350 minus 50. This would be the incorrect amount, right? Because we're using the wrong number here. We should be using 35 here. But the incorrect cost of goods sold in 2017 would be 340. And that's incorrect. And the correct cost of goods sold in 2017 would be using the correct number there, 35. It should be 335, right? So we would we would state cost of goods sold at 340, but it really should be 335. So we overstate it by five. So what was the net effect? The net effect over the two years in year one, cost of goods sold is understated by five. But in year two, it's overstated by five. So the net effect is they wash out. But in, the, in a given year, it's wrong on the financial statements. The investors are making decisions with their money based on incorrect information. Same thing um, in the first year, the ending inventory is overstated. But in the second year, we counted it right. So it's not incorrectly stated. This 50, it said, was counted correctly. So I guess in the second year, they realized, oh, we're not going to double count anymore. See, this should be 335. So it's 5,000 overstated. And you can imagine if we if we reverse everything in the first, in 2016, if we had, what did we originally, we, we overstated inventory because we double counted. What if we forgot to count something? So we understate inventory in 2016. Then in 2016, cost of goods sold would be overstated. And then 2017, cost of goods sold would be understated by the same amount. Assuming in 2017, we got the ending inventory right, assuming that was right. All right, the next concept in this chapter, uh, yeah, the way to solve those inventory errors problems is you just set up a key account and solve the equation, putting the correct amount and the incorrect amount, and then you can look and see which is over or understated. That's the way to solve those. Uh, the next sort of thing in this chapter is, um, this lower of cost or net realizable value idea. I'll call it a concept. The book calls everything methods, but then you get confused. You think like this is competing with FIFO or life. No, it's not. It's just a different. There's two methods, periodic and perpetual. There's four costing procedures, specific identification, FIFO, LIFO, and weighted average. You can do those four with either periodic or perpetual. We, we've shown you how to do it with periodic. Appendix 6A shows you how to do it with perpetual, and we'll show you that as well if I have time. And then there's these other concepts called, this, this is one of them, lower of cost or net realizable value. Whether you use, you're using periodic or perpetual method or any of those four um, procedures to value your inventory, you always have to apply this concept in your company. So the concept is companies must ensure that whatever cost they record as their ending inventory, 
that it does not exceed the net realizable value of that, of that inventory. The net realizable value is what they think that they could get for that inventory if they sold it on the open market, minus any cost they would have to incur to sell the stuff or dispose of it. So at the end of every period, they have to go look at their inventory T account, look at the dollar value that they've assigned, and compare that to the net realizable value. Now in the problems, you'll be given the net realizable value. But in practice, the company has to go and figure that out based on you know, surveys, um, what, other what other companies are pricing their products, that if, if they're selling the same type of product we are with their pricing, that could be a net. Uh, that could be a, a, a surrogate for the net realizable value of our stuff. So if the net realizable value, which is what you could get for it, is less than what you're saying it's worth on your books, you got to write down your inventory to the net realizable value. If the net realizable value um, is more than what you say it's worth on your books, then you don't have to do anything. No adjustment is made. So example is, at the end of June, this Kanzu, they had the 22 collars left in their inventory. And assume they recorded $14 as the cost of each of them. So they would, that means they're valuing their inventory at um, 308, the FIFO method. Suppose they use the FIFO method. And then let's suppose that they estimate they could get only $12 for each collar if they sold it. So the net realizable value of their inventory is 264. What they estimate they could get from a potential customer is less than what they think it's worth on their books. They got to write down their inventory. You always, when you write down your inventory, you just debit cost of goods sold expense and you credit inventory. That's the journal entry. So assets go down and owner's equity goes down because you're debiting an expense. Do we have a, no, no questions, all right. All right, and you're also responsible for a couple of ratios. Inventory turnover. This is a measure of, on average, how many times it, a firm sells its inventory or turns its inventory over in a given year. We just take our cost of goods sold expense in dollars on the, in the numerator and divide that by our average inventory value. This average inventory value is just the beginning inventory value plus the ending inventory value divided by two. It's just the average of the beginning and the ending. So the denominator is actually a ratio itself. So here's an example. Assume Kanzu maintained an average inventory level of $300. So they already calculated that this is 300 for you. And its cost of goods sold for the year was 7,500. Then their inventory turnover would be, so these are both measured in dollars, so the dollars cancel. It's just 25 times. $7,500 divided by $300 is 25. So it's a measure of how many times they turned over their inventory. And to make it make sense, like this is the dollar value on average of what they have in their inventory, just $300. And this is the dollar value of the stuff they sold. You know, this is what it costs for the goods they sold. This is what it cost them to buy those goods. And for the goods that are not sold, this is what it costs them to have those goods on average. And so you take those, the ratio of those two costs, and it's a measure, it's a measure of how many times you, you sold all your inventory. I mean, to sell your inventory once, if the stuff that you have on hand on average cost you $300, you would have to have cost of goods sold at $300. It'd be a one time. And you can imagine 7,500 divided by 300 is 25 times. Hopefully that makes sense intuitively. Obviously, the bigger, the better. The more you turn your inventory over, the better. And then day sales and inventory, it requires the inventory turnover in it. So you calculate inventory turnover first. 
and then you divide that by 365 days. And this ratio, it just tells you on average how many days it takes you to sell your, to turn your inventory over. So if you turned your inventory over 25 times in a year, and there's 365 days in a year, then on average you're turning your inventory over how many times per day? I'm sorry, you, I, I, I flipped that. If there's 365 days in a year, and during the year you turned your inventory over 25 times, how many days did it take you per time? 14.6. I don't know why there's a dollar sign there. That shouldn't be there. 14.6 days. This is days in a year. This is times. So days per time you turn your inventory over. So obviously, you want days sales and inventory, the smaller the better, right? If you could turn your inventory over every day, like sell all of it in one day, oh, that'd be great. Assuming you could get it, have plenty on hand. All right, quick check. Pick company reports average annual inventory of $200 and cost of goods sold of 1000 What can be said about Pick's inventory? You have to do a couple calculations for this one. What's the inventory turnover? How many times do they turn it over in a given year on average? Five, that's right. Inventory turnover is cost of goods sold divided by the average value of our inventory. So five. So B looks to be correct. And then what's days sales in inventory for this, for pick? The other ratio, days sales in inventory. It's 365 days divided by five times in a year. So 365 divided by five, is that 73? Each time they turn over the inventory, it takes uh, 73 days. So inventory turnover is five times a year. And day sales and inventory is 73 days per time. So the only right answer, I guess, is B. Good. All right, Appendix 6A, we're not going to have time to get into it today because I don't want to start it and not be able to finish it. But in Appendix 6A, we basically just go through, I mean, you know both of these bullet points already. And we basically just go through the same example. Um, well, the same example here, but and we're doing FIFO, LIFO, and weighted average, but we're using the perpetual method. And so I'll show you how to do that. It turns out the FIFO, if you're using the FIFO procedure, you're going to get the same numbers. Whether you use perpetual method or periodic method, you're going to get the same numbers for ending inventory and cost of goods sold. Don't those numbers look familiar? Those are the same numbers we got when we did FIFO, assuming that Kanzu was a periodic company. Now we're assuming they're a perpetual company. So with FIFO, you're going to get the same. It's only with LIFO and weighted average where you could get different numbers. So your LIFO COGS and ending inventory. And I don't like the way that they do it right here. I don't think this is very explanatory. That's why I'm going to explain to you. I'll go over this example right here in the PowerPoints next time when we do the problems on Thursday. I'll do it and I'll do it my way. I don't like, I don't feel this is very 
conducive to knowing what's going on. But notice that um, now we're assuming Kanzu uses perpetual method and their LIFO COGS is not 998. It was 998 earlier, right? Now it's 980. And their LIFO ending inventory is 284. It's not 266. So those are different. And I'll show you how to do the LIFO method, assuming perpetual. And the same thing with weighted average. The numbers will be different. I believe the COGS um, under weighted average method, assuming Kanzu uses a periodic, was 974. Assuming Kanzu uses perpetual, it's 963. And I can't remember the ending inventory under the periodic. It was something different than 301. So weighted average and LIFO will produce, will produce different numbers for COGS and ending inventory respectively, perpetual versus periodic method. But they won't produce different numbers. So FIFO weighted average and LIFO will all produce the same numbers regardless of which method. If one thing holds, you see this sequence of purchases and sales. If we don't have any purchases after a sale, then, whether the company uses perpetual or periodic, LIFO, FIFO, and weighted average will produce exactly, well, they won't, the FIFO COGS and the LIFO COGS won't be the same, but the FIFO COGS periodic and the FIFO COGS perpetual, that's always the same. The LIFO COGS periodic and LIFO COGS perpetual will be the same, and the weighted average co COGS perpetual versus periodic will be the same, and the ending inventory the same. Um, if there are no purchases after a sale. Here there's a purchase after a sale, right here. So if you look in the sequences of purchases and sales, if you see a sale, oh no, this isn't true. There can't be a purchase after a sale or before a sale for that to be true, sorry. You either have to have all purchases or all sales. You can't have a sequence of purchases and sales. So how do I write this down? It doesn't say this in the book actually, but it's true. I don't know how to. LIFO COGS perpetual equals LIFO COGS periodic if no no it, it is true what I said originally if no purchases after a sale it is true what I said originally after a sale so if we just had if these things didn't happen then there wouldn't be a purchase after a sale. And the LIFO COGS perpetual method would be the same as a LIFO COGS periodic method. And I haven't shown you how to do LIFO under the perpetual method yet. We're going to show you that next time. Same thing for the weighted average here. Weighted average COGS perpetual equals weighted average COGS periodic if this condition holds. And same thing for ending inventory. LIFO ending inventory under perpetual will be the same as LIFO ending inventory under periodic if there's no purchases after a sale. Weighted average, same thing. Um, FIFO COGS perpetual equals FIFO COGS periodic always, no matter what, what the sequences of purchases and sales are. All right, we have some new, oh no, we don't have any new questions. I'll repeat that, this uh, statement here on Thursday. You're also responsible for, uh, notice even, even under the perpetual method, FIFO COGS is still the smallest and FIFO ending inventory is still the largest. I mean, those, those relations between FIFO weighted average and LIFO, those hold regardless of whether we're perpetual or periodic. 
You're also responsible for uh, Appendix 6B, the lipo reserve. So I want to go over this in the remaining four minutes. So the, the lipo reserve is just the difference between the company's um, ending inventory valued under using the FIFO method or the FIFO procedure. The difference between that and if they would have used the LIFO method, what, what it would have produced for the ending inventory value. This is the LIFO reserve. Companies using LIFO must disclose the value of this reserve. In other words, they have to tell their investors, if we had used FIFO, um, our ending inventory would have been this. And you can clearly see what our ending inventory is now because we use LIFO. And then you can, actually the company just has to disclose the difference. And then if you know this number, then you can back out this number, of course. They have to disclose the LIFO reserve. Why, why do they have to do that? Because um, it's important. Certain financial ratios, which involve ending inventory, like the current ratio, right? They're, they'll be different, right? If the company used FIFO versus LIFO, right? The current ratio is current assets on, over current liabilities. Inventory is a current asset. FIFO ending inventory is gonna be bigger than LIFO ending inventory if prices are rising. So the current ratio for a FIFO company, since the, the numerator is bigger, is going to be bigger than the current ratio if the company used LIFO, right? So that's important to know the, and so you can figure out what the ratio would be. You can see what the current ratio would be if they use LIFO because they, they report all their stuff in life using LIFO, they report the inventory using LIFO. But then you could say, oh, what if they use FIFO? What would their current ratio be? You wouldn't be able to determine that unless they tell you the LIFO reserve, then you could back out, right? You could just increase assets, increase the numerator by the by the value of this reserve, and that, and then and then use that to calculate the current ratio. And that'd be the, that would be the current ratio if they had used FIFO to value their inventory. And there's other ratios that are affected. Anything that has inventory or cost of goods sold in it, it would be affected. Because those are the two things that these methods are trying to estimate: cost of goods sold and in and ending inventory. So the current ratio is affected the inventory turnover is affected right that has cost of goods sold in it that has cost of goods sold and in inventory it has it in both places one in the numerator one in the denominator day sales and inventory is affected because it, it has it because it has this in it and so forth so in our, in our simple example kanzu's inventory value under lifo was 266 and under fifo was 308 and so the the LIFO inventory reserve is just 308 minus 266. $42. So all I have to give you is the company's LIFO ending inventory or their FIFO ending inventory, either one, and then tell you the LIFO reserve and you can calculate the other one, right? You can calculate the other. Hopefully that makes sense and then the CSR stuff. All right, we are out of time. On uh, Thursday, I'm going to go through, the first thing I'm gonna do is this PowerPoint example with Kanzu, but I'm going to assume Kanzu is using the perpetual system, and we're gonna go through FIFO, LIFO, and weighted average, and how you would calculate those. Well, FIFO would be the same, so not FIFO. LIFO and weighted average. And then I'm going to, after that, I might go through another problem at the end of, in the appendix to chapter six, to appendix A, which highlights the difference between perpetual and periodic. And then I'll probably do a problem about the LIFO inventory reserve, teach you something a little bit more about that that I didn't have time to go over today, but it's in appendix B. And um, try with any time I have left, I'll maybe do a problem or two over the ratios, but I think you guys are good on ratios. So that's what's coming up.
Are there any questions? I know it's a lot to process. Chapter six is usually a lot for for the kids to process, but um, once they get actually studying it and working problems, they find it to be pretty pretty straightforward. Students usually don't do uh, poorly on the exam in regards to the chapter six stuff, which I always thought they would, but the tech, they get it. It's actually not that bad. Your TAs will help you a lot as well. All right, well, I'm going to stop recording.